Welcome back to Jacques in the Garden. It is summer, it's 92 degrees, and it is a little bit gross, but we still have a lot to do in the garden. And we're gonna kick it off by actually clearing out this bed in entirety so that we could solarize it. I'm also going to be starting some seeds, doing some harvesting, and pruning up some stuff. We've got a lot to do today. I'm already sweating like crazy, so let's go ahead and just get started, and you'll see exactly why you might want to solarize as well, and also we'll see what kind of harvest I get along the way. Before we get too carried away with removing everything and also actually solarizing, I do need to harvest everything edible out of this bed. We've got peppers, cucumbers, leeks, a couple random onions, and actually some of these leeks have gone to flower. Now I'm gonna talk about saving that seed in a moment here, but first I'm gonna go through and harvest anything that's edible. So here's what we got from just this bed. We've got a good two dozen peppers or so. I've got a tiny little young ginger that I planted earlier this season. I knew this wasn't the hottest bed, but we did get a little bit of a harvest there. And we've got about 10 really nice leeks here. Now these leeks are actually quite well blanched and they're very, very tender feeling. So this right here is like a three foot leek, no problem. Lots of white at the bottom and it's still good. I'm actually surprised that I could keep leeks going for this long in the season here in San Diego, but it worked. So I wasn't even trying to do an experiment. I just kind of forgot about them and that's what happened. Now, as for the leeks over here, there's three more, actually two more that are actually flowered. What we're going to do here is I want to actually save seed from this. I just, on the, the Beat podcast, which is our gardening podcast, I spoke to somebody uh, called Adam Alexander, who is a seed saver for well over 30 years. He wrote this really interesting book about seed saving. It got me really into the idea of saving more seed here in my garden. So what I'm going to do is, since I have to remove these, I'm going to pull them so that they're still intact on the roots. They still have all the energy of the plant itself, and I'm going to just set this aside somewhere to allow the seed to fully mature before harvesting it. So we'll save that. In a future video, you might see me planting my own leek seeds. And then, oh, looks like I actually have one more leek here that I forgot about. And then really the saddest loss here is the sunflower and also these cucumbers behind me. So I do have about one, two, three, four cucumbers to harvest. And then I'll cut those plants out, get rid of these sunflowers, which is a huge bummer. And then we'll go to solarize. Now that all the plants are gone, I'm going to scoop up all of this mulch because it's actually going to hinder our solarization project. And what I'm going to do is put it in this black plastic container, leave it on the driveway so it could get absolutely baked and hopefully destroy any signs of pest or bad life that might live on this rock. So what we've done is we've cleared the bed, we removed most of the straw, and then what I just finally did is I threw on a very, very skim layer of raised bed soil from Fox Farm. Doesn't matter what you're using in this case, I just wanted something that's a dark color because that'll absorb the sun even more. Because if you don't know by now what solarization is, I haven't actually told you, it is the process of using the sun to essentially cook your garden bed or whatever part of your garden to do a few different things. Now, one of those things is to kill pests like root knot nematode that cannot tolerate the heat. Another thing is to smother and kill any weeds or weed seeds that might be living on the surface. Any sort of pest that lives in the top couple inches of the soil will essentially be eradicated. And also what else will be killed is probably anything that's beneficial in terms of fungal life or anything like that. So this is kind of a scorched earth policy, but in this case, I am so sick of dealing with these root knot nematodes. They are spreading. I do not want them to take over my garden and make me sad forever. So we're taking some serious action here and we're going to cook them. So I'm gonna go grab the plastic and we'll talk about how to actually set this up properly so you get the best solarization you could possibly get. So as usual, I did lie to you guys. I said I would just grab the plastic and cover it, but instead what I did is I remembered I had French marigolds and I remembered I just bought a $50 used lawnmower on Craigslist. So I chopped up the marigolds, sprinkled them on the surface because French marigolds are also good at fighting root knot nematodes. Then I dusted it with neem cake fertilizer mix, which can also actually help fight nematodes. And then finally, I did one final little layer of that raised bed soil just to get it a little bit hotter. Now, you could see that my irrigation's still in place. I'm mentioning that because when you are solarizing, you want your soil to be wet. You want it to be nice, steamy, hot. It'll get it even warmer. It'll get the heat to penetrate deeper. And actually, I was just reading on the UC IPM website 
And this can help with root knot nematodes, but they can technically burrow deeper than the killing heat. Now, the other thing that I forgot to mention is that this also kills fungal diseases. So that's a huge added benefit for me because that is something that is always prevalent in my garden. So what I'm going to do now is roll out this greenhouse plastic and we're going to tuck it in to the edges here so it's buried in the soil. We wanna create a really nice seal to trap as much heat as we could physically possibly trap and get this bed absolutely cooked. If this is set up properly and you're doing it really in the middle of summer, we're a little bit past middle of summer, your soil will easily reach 140 degrees. Now that will kill a lot of things just like a hot compost would, and that's exactly what we're trying to recreate right here in this bed. Whew, that's all tucked in. I could already see steam building and it feels warm to the touch. So at this point, we're just going to leave it. I'm gonna leave it for probably three to four weeks because I want it to get as cooked as it could possibly get until everything in there is toast. So we'll check back on this in a future video, but for now, let's move on to the next project and hopefully it's a little bit cooler than this one. And thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Mud Water, a functional coffee alternative made with reishi mushrooms, masala chai, and cacao for a perfect non-jittery boost of energy. With just 35 milligrams of caffeine, it has a fraction of the caffeine of a standard cup of coffee, which is usually 90 plus. And I don't know about you guys, but I can have one cup of coffee, but if I have a second, my hands will be jittery, I'll be all shaky, and I don't really like the feeling. And I've actually been using Mud Water for years now is my go-to for that midday lull where you just need a little bit of pick-me-up. And it all starts with one tablespoon of the mud water and then a little bit of hot water, like three quarters of a cup. And then you want to froth it before topping it off with your favorite milk. As an added bonus, it is USDA organic, has zero grams of added sugar and no sweeteners added. And it's also actually quite delicious because it tastes like a spiced hot cocoa. Now, all the energy comes from the cacao and the cordyceps mushrooms. You also get some focus, mental focus from the lion's mane and immunity support from the reishi and chaga mushrooms that are included in every single sip. So if you're searching for a little midday pick-me-up, give Mudwater a try. And if you use the code Jacques in the Garden, you'll get 15% off a starter kit plus a free frog with your purchase. So thanks again to Mudwater for making this delicious drink and for sponsoring today's video. If I had to rate this season overall, I'd say it was pretty decent. The spring was fantastic. I got wonderful harvest, early summer, fantastic. Once I got through the, about the beginning of August, the garden started to have a lot of fungal issues, started having more disease problems, and there's just been some dieback. In this case, I don't even know what the heck is happening to the zucchini. It's like inverted on itself but it definitely doesn't look normal. Even the flowers themselves don't look normal. Let me pick one over here so I can show you guys. This is as big as it's getting. So that's weird. That's not normal. That's not what it's supposed to do. So what I've decided is I'm going to rip this squash, this squash. I'm gonna leave the two behind me because they've been actually doing okay. Even though this one definitely got attacked by, oh yeah, that's been attacked by a gopher. It's basically barely in the ground there. So what we're going to do is we're going to plant a little bit of cover crop in this bed instead. It's not like it's doing anything productive. I'd rather actually try to fix the entire bed, build up its organic matter rather than just leave it producing a zucchini here and there randomly, but not actually producing anything healthy at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull first, because I want to take a look at the roots, make sure we don't have a nematode issue. Mm. And we do have a nematode issue. So this is just kind of plaguing my garden. <sighs> so now the question is, do I want to plant a cover crop of mustard here or do I want to solarize? I'm already solarizing that one. So let's go ahead. We're going to rip this bed entirely. We're going to plant some cover crop. Wow, there's definitely a lot of fungal activity here though. You could see it all on this bamboo stake. So that is interesting to see, although it did not actually kill the nematodes. So whatever sort of mushroom that is, mycelium, it wasn't one that was beneficial to actually eating nematodes. Yep, got some galls on that one too. Oh man. So the thing that's most frustrating, so this one, I'll show you this one because it's very clearly gopher damage and not a nematode issue. So if you take a look here, you'll see that it is chewed up. The base of this plant here has been gnawed on. It's actually missing part of the stem. Basically no roots came up. So something's definitely eating this. I'm going to assume it's a gopher, but regardless, what we're going to do now is we're going to plant some mustard cover crop in here. And we'll talk a little bit about that and how to best go about doing that. We got one squash out of there. I am going to leave the zinnia here because it's just a zinnia and I don't care if it has nematode damage, it's still flowering and looking great. 
So what I'm going to do next is, again, probably scoop up this straw, and we are going to reapply it in this case, but I do want it out of the way for when we're broadcasting some mustard seed onto this bed because we want to get really good contact with the soil here. And pretty soon we're going to need to trim this whole grape because it is taking over random parts of my garden. It's growing a little bit too vigorously. While we're here, I'm also going to remove this towering basil. Turns out that this variety was not actually immune to downy mildew and it suffered downy mildew damage. If you don't know what downy mildew is, take a look at this leaf over here of basil. You can see on the bottom here, it has some of this kind of brownish black powder. That is the mildew itself. It gets onto the bottom of the basil leaves, makes it not really palatable, and eventually it does kill the plant. Now, there are varieties of basil that we actually carry one now called the Naga uh, Prospera-based basil that has downy mildew resistance, and that is usually what I plant. But this is one I wanted to try just to see how it would do. It does smell wonderful, but it's definitely covered in downy mildew, and there's really no point in keeping it around to propagate that disease. Now that we have all the mulch out of the way, what I want to do is water the surface of the soil. We want to get it nice and sticky before we put any seed down. So let's go ahead and do that. Now that we've watered the surface of the soil, what I want to do is take a tool like this potato fork here. I'm just going to drag it across the very surface. I'm trying to create little furrows here for a seed to fall into. So the soil isn't perfectly wet. We just barely skimmed it but it does create enough texture to allow some seed to really catch in the soil. And now what I'm going to do is scatter the seed across this entire bed. Now this is the Mighty Mustard Pacific Gold Mustard. This is one that was actually studied and developed specifically for the purpose of fighting fungal disease and root knot nematode. The way it works is it produces so much of like that mustardy flavor that once it's fully grown and you chop it and mix it into the soil, it basically pepper gases or mustard gases the soil and kills all those root knot nematodes. Now I did try to do it in the bed that we solarized, but I didn't do that good of a job there. I did do it in my big patch in the back where I've already pulled some tomatoes and they have no signs of root knot nematode. So I do think it worked at least over there. So I wanna to try to recreate those exact same conditions here in this bed. And then we're gonna water in the seed, make sure that it actually gets moist but we don't want to water too heavily because we don't want to wash the seed away. Now at this point, I would prefer to cover it with some amount of soil just to really give it a nice coverage. So what I'm going to do is grab a little bit of compost and we're going to just skim the surface just to hide all the seed from the surface. And now we're going to cover it all up again with a little bit of mulch. The goal here is to make sure we get really good germination and that's what the compost and mulch will help achieve. And now what I'm going to do is deadhead, remove some dead plants, and harvest out this particular bed before we get onto some seed starting. So now I think we did a pretty good job cleaning up here. We removed that old Cosmo, deadheaded the straw flowers, which definitely needed it. And now what I want to do is go through and harvest all of these beautiful Fresno peppers. And I actually really have grown to appreciate the Fresno pepper. It's got a decent amount of kick, but it's got a lot of meat and pepper to it. So you could actually do a lot of interesting things with it, whether it's making like sauces, like a spicy romesco, throw a couple of those in in your set, or just roasting them up and making your own sort of salsas and things like that. So let's go ahead and harvest them up, then we'll pop over to the other garden and see what's next. So we've got about a dozen Fresno peppers harvested. I'm actually seeing a decent amount of shishitos here, so we'll see, maybe we'll do shishito peppers tonight for dinner. But now, Let's pop over to the other side and talk about some seeds that we want to get started right now. So here we are at my seedling table, which I've rigged with some shade cloth. Now the main areas of shade are on top and on this side because the sun rises over there, sets over there, which means that this shade cloth is blocking that late afternoon hot sun. Now the other thing you'll notice is that on the very back, I have some bird netting. On this side, I've just loosely hung this white sort of cloth. And that was supposed to actually stop the birds because take a look at this tray over here you'll notice that there's nothing in it. In fact, there was something in it this morning when I checked that's now gone, and that is from birds plucking out the seedlings. Now, sometimes they do it to eat the seedling or they wanna eat the seed. Sometimes they do it just for fun to see what's underneath. But nevertheless, I've basically, out of eight cells, I only got three sunflowers that survived. You can even see some of the damaged ones, like the ones that got plucked. None of the squash made it, none of the actual cucumbers made it, and none of my artichokes made it. They all got destroyed. And the other thing that happened was actually a lot of my brassicas are getting attacked by caterpillars such as the cabbage looper, the cabbage moth, and they have really gone to town. You could tell right here that a lot of these are missing almost all of their leaves, in fact, and it's not looking that great, but they'll be fine. I just need to make sure that they are protected. What I did is I potted them from six cells into four cells, and as I was doing that, a hand plucked off 
at least 20 caterpillars from this tray of seedlings. So hopefully that was all of them, but what I'll probably do is do a BT spray, Bacillus thuringiensis. That is something that affects only caterpillars, and I'm only going to spray it on these seedlings, so it shouldn't affect any other wildlife here. Just protect my individual seedlings, because if these don't make it, they're not gonna be big enough to actually give me early harvest. This was the batch of seed that I wanted to put in so I could get harvest in December, and maybe even November, of broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower. And now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna set up probably three or four trays of seedling cells, and I'm gonna to go to town on starting every single broccoli I have, every cabbage, every cauliflower, some greens, things like mustard greens, kale, collard greens. I need to start some more uh, artichokes, clearly. Might do one like random hurrah of cucumbers, one that has a short season, maybe like a bush cucumber. And I'll also be looking at maybe a couple more flowers. You guys probably saw that last video of me starting my fall seeds, at least the early ones. I already have a decent amount of flowers and herbs. I have a bunch of zinnias, nasturtiums. I have some flax, a bunch of snapdragons, which I'm excited for. Calendulas, hollyhocks that'll bloom the following season. And actually some herbs as well, like parsley, cilantro, and uh, what else? Oh, I have my early tomatoes as well. Early tomatoes, in this case, I'm planting in the fall to try to get that late fall harvest. I've never planted them this late as seedlings, so I don't know if it'll really be worth it or work, but I could always sneak one into the greenhouse and I should be able to get some sort of harvest at least. So that's kind of the game plan here, is we're working and we're marching towards fall. Now the reason these are potted up is because A, I had to save them from the caterpillar damage, and B, I just don't have any space in the garden yet. It's still quite hot here in September, and I'm eventually cycling out these beds. As you saw today, we cleared two beds on that side of the garden. Last video, we did some work on the other side of the garden. And basically, by the end of this month, I expect that we will have some free beds, and that's where these will go, and they will give me my early season harvest so I could harvest my broccoli, cabbages, and cauliflower sometime in November, in December, and I don't have to wait until actually in January, February, March, and so on. That's what these are for. All the seeds I start today will be most likely harvested closer to that January time window. But yeah, get out there, get your seeds started. It's absolutely critical. And the biggest one that I should mention, actually, I almost forgot, is start your onions now. If you wanna transplant onions in your garden from seed, now is really the best time to do it because they take a long time to reach maturity as seedlings and you don't wanna waste your time and miss your window. If it gets too late in the season, there's not enough sun and you won't really get much out of those onions. So get your seeds going, please. Check your soil for nematode damage. Maybe you could do a last bit of solarization like I have, or you could plant a cover crop of mustard like I also did. Those are both options that should work great. I know the mustard has worked at least in this section of my garden. I just don't think I did it as well on that side last year. So thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.